The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, um, My Way by Frank Sinatra, and Stegosaurus. Three probably very burning questions I know you are all wondering, uh, but that, in order, is my favorite book, my favorite song, and my favorite dinosaur. I threw the dinosaur in there because it's actually quite sad how no one asks adults what their favorite dinosaur is. I give this information freely to you so that you might have some idea as to who I am as a person. Now, this is what we typically do. When we want to get to know someone, we ask questions about them. We study them. We see their mannerisms, the way that they interact with things and with people, and we learn as much about them as we can. The idea is that we can come to know them in a deeper, less superficial way if we, in a sense, knows what it is that makes them tick. I think the question posed to us this morning, then, is when we look at Jesus Christ, what is it that we see? The answer to this question, unfortunately, is loaded because I think it's no surprise that there are a bunch of different Jesuses floating around. It seems to me that everyone tries to make their own personal Jesus where they sort of say, uh, I really like hippie Jesus or super awesome warrior Jesus. And when you go into churches, there are all sorts of different depictions of Jesuses. You can find pictures of a black Jesus, of a Korean Jesus. You can find pictures of Jesus in Italian clothes when you look at the Last Supper. There are some pictures that have him looking like Ted Nugent for some odd reason. So our understanding of Jesus is peppered by how we view Jesus. And oftentimes, the way that we view Jesus is not based on what we read in the Bible, but sort of our own preconceived notions. The phrase I like to use a lot, and will continue to do so, is the authentic Jesus. It's not enough to know the historical Jesus, but the authentic Jesus and how do we do that? And why is that even so important? Well, part of the reason that it's important is because of God. If I ask you to think about God or to describe God, you would quite possibly uh, give me somebody who is a very tall, uh, big white beard, winds up looking like Gandalf from Lord of the Rings. Because that's how we view things and process things first. We try to do physical appearances, and yet when we read Scripture, no one's ever seen God per se, and Moses had that time where he saw the back of God. And if we try to think about God, well, our head starts hurting because God, by God's nature, is infinite. We call God the beginning, the end, the alpha, the omega, all of these things, and so God, by God's nature, is unknowable to us. And yet, when we know Jesus, we come to know God more fully. So when we have a better understanding of the authentic Christ, we have a better understanding of God. Now, all of this is important because today is Palm Sunday. We are a week away from the resurrection. We're a few days away from Monday, Thursday, and the celebration of the Passover, from the betrayal of Christ on Good Friday where he is crucified, and then Sunday he is risen. Holy Week is one of the most cosmically important weeks of all time and space. The things that happened on this week shaped and changed the world as we know it. So if we want to come to understand God, we have to then come to understand Jesus. It is of vital importance for us. But the problem with that is we have our own preconceived notions. You know, oftentimes we like Jesus as a winner. We don't want to see Jesus kind of down in the dumps. We like happy Jesus. Do you know that in most of our churches, we don't have crucifixes? Because when you look at a crucifix and you see Jesus on the cross, well, that's sad and depressing and kind of a bummer. So we populate our churches with empty crosses, post-resurrection crosses, and we have beautiful pictures of Jesus. There's Jesus teaching in the temple as a child there. 
And we populate ourselves with these notions of Jesus. And when we look at what happens this day, I believe Palm Sunday gives us the best look at the authentic Christ. What we find there is, I'm going to warn you ahead of time, rather odd. It's not only odd, it's slightly confusing. My confusion started this year as I'm reading this passage, and one phrase stuck out to me like a splinter in my mind. An unridden colt. So he's on a donkey, and we understand that. Like, we see donkeys, we know what donkeys look like, and donkeys are kind of these weird, obnoxious animals, but they're good workers, they're hard workers. That You can pile stuff up on the back of a donkey, and it may make a weird noise and have a goofy-looking face, but it'll move that thing. But here's the thing about this donkey, it was unridden. It had never been ridden before. It didn't carry anything before. So it didn't necessarily know and have the muscle memory for what it's like when somebody is on top of it. Now, I've lifted things. You know, the key to lifting heavy things is, is take your back completely out of the equation, just lift with your legs. Um, don't do that. That's a horrible joke. Um, but you know, when you lift things, you kind of bend down and you pick it up. Now, when you are going to pick something up and you think it's heavy, you're going to add more muscle to it. And when you think something is going to be lighter, you will have less muscle. There are times I have been pleasantly and unfortunately surprised when I've lifted up things. And when those moments happen, the same thing happens. I'm unsteady. I sort of do this little movement and try to steady myself. I'm not expecting the weight. And this donkey, this colt, was not expecting weight. It had been unridden. Now, yes, we can look at this in terms of, of metaphor and, and how you know, Christ is using these fresh things. And we could go on at length about the donkey itself. But it was unridden. And I don't know a lot about animals, but I do know when an animal is new and trying something new, it's going to be unsteady. And so this is actually our first inclination that something odd is going on here. Because how Jesus enters in is essentially like a conquering king. This procession that he does would not have seemed out of place for the people of Christ's time. What it would have looked like, though, is drastically different. It would have probably had a Roman general. A Roman general who just came back triumphantly from a battle, carrying his helmet in his hand, his sword at his side, on a, just, um, on a large, majestic white horse, sort of doing the, the princess wave to the people, showing off his might, his power, the fact that he led the troops to battle and they have conquered the foes. That's what they would have been used to. Or they would have seen a king. A king riding in with dancers and tambourine players touting the goodness of the king, the way he is benevolent. These are things that the people would have seen. And this is what happens. This is a kingly procession. This is a general procession going on here. But when you look at the mechanics and the nuts and bolts of it, it doesn't make sense. Where's the nice horse? No, instead you get an unridden, wobbly, weird-looking donkey. Where's the sword? Where's the, the symbol of power? You know, does he have a crown? Medieval paintings often have Jesus holding an orb because it's sort of this symbol of power in, in kingly majesty and might. There's no orb there. There's no crown. He's just riding the donkey into town. And yet what he is doing here is nothing less than a declaration. It's a twofold declaration. First, it's saying the battle is over and I have won. Again, Roman generals would have entered towns like this, and they would have done so being victorious after a battle. And Jesus is declaring, we've won. The fight is over, and we 
have won. Even though there is no shot fired, there's no great battlefield, some battle has been won. The second thing that this is, is a kingly procession. And we notice that because of what the people say as he rides in. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Who are they referring to? Has to be Jesus He's the only one riding into town looking like a king. So the people are now proclaiming Jesus as king. And that's right. They should be doing that. They absolutely should because as we know, Jesus Christ is king of kings and lord of lords. And then the Pharisees panic because of course they do. And their panic here, they're not mad. They're scared. And they have every reason to be scared. You see, the people are still living under Roman occupation. The Romans rule them, and so there are certain rules that they have to follow. And one of those rules that they have to follow is, there is no king but Caesar. And yet now there is a throng of people, a crowd, proclaiming, here is the good king. This is sedition. This is treason. And how the Romans dealt with treason and sedition was crucifixion. Was the death penalty. Fearing the blowback that this might create politically, the Pharisees tell Jesus, tell them to stop. Please tell them to stop. Be quiet. This is not going to end well. They're not being mean. They're not being cruel. They're panicking. Their eyes are set on earthly things as opposed to heavenly things, and what they're seeing is a king. In no way, shape, or form has Jesus at this point proclaimed himself king of kings and lord of lords. All he tells the disciples to do is, hey, go get a donkey so I can ride it into town. He's having the kingly procession without it being majestic and loud and bombastic. He himself never does that. He's not saying, hey guys, look at me. I'm of the line of David. I'm the king. I'm the Messiah. These are all things that are placed on Jesus. And yet as they are placed on Jesus, it doesn't make sense because we would think that the Messiah should be big and awesome and strong. We expect the horse. We expect people in positions of power to not come quietly, but to come with power that befits their status. This is the disconnect that leads to the cross. The expectation of who they want Jesus to be and who Jesus actually is. And this is the disconnect that we struggle with in our lives today. Who is this Jesus? What does he mean to us? We proclaim him King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but it's much more complicated than that. Our reading in Philippians has a little bit more about Jesus, but really the section before it, Paul is giving the people a sort of rundown on who Jesus is. He's explaining to the people how uh, Jesus is the Messiah, but kind of different. And so what happens now is we get this nice little Christologically important passage where we get to hear uh, fully the same substance of God, but of man as well. And so Paul is trying to say, okay, Jesus is really awesome, and here's why. Because he's both fully God and fully human. And that's important. And the reason that's important is because Jesus, being of the same substance as God, can do literally everything. Anything he wanted done, he could do. Like, I don't know, turning stones into bread, which was where we started this whole thing with calling forth an army of angels to protect him if he flung himself off of a building. 
feeding multitudes of people, raising the dead, bringing new life. All of these things are things that Jesus could do. Some of them are things that he did do. But how? And that becomes the question. How? How is it that Jesus uses his power? It's like poetry. It rhymes. It goes back to the beginning of our Lenten journey. He never used his power for his own personal gain. He never used his power to make his life more comfortable or exert force over people. He used his power, as Paul says, in perfect obedience. The fact that a guy who could do literally anything, use your imagination here, the guy who could do anything because he is of the same substance as God and yet also fully human, chose to ride into town on a donkey to allow himself to be obedient to the point of death on the cross. That is who Jesus is. Perfect obedience. Perfect love. And Paul says, be like that. Now we know we can't exactly be like that. It's very hard for us. I personally, uh, I can make a lot of spaghetti, but I have to open a lot of boxes with which to do that. I can't create nothing out of something. I can't bring people back to life. Jesus can, so how then am I supposed to be like Jesus? Because that's the goal. We are the imitators of Christ. We are created to be the flag bearers, the image bearers of God in the world. So how are we supposed to do that? Well, Paul says, it's kind of simple, be like Christ. Awesome, I can't do half the cool stuff that Jesus does. So I guess I'm stuck not doing the thing that I'm supposed to do. And yet Paul does not want to leave the church in that position. He says, Christ emptied himself. Set aside that power to do anything that he wanted to do and didn't do it. Taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, going through all of the pain, the emotions, the trauma that we just as people live through on a daily basis. God experienced that. I cannot tell you how important that is. We have a God who knows exactly what it's like to be us because that God was with us. In all of the ways, in all of the ways that this God has went through the things that we have gone through. Jesus went through that. Knowing what it's like for us. God identifies with us. And how did he do it? Jesus was never walking around with this sort of swagger like, look at me, I'm so awesome. Look at all the cool things I can do. He never brags. He just rode in on a donkey. Because I think most people will agree that Jesus was a pretty nice guy. Regardless as to um, religious ideologies, most people, I would say, will say that, yeah, Jesus was really nice. He was just a good guy. You know, that whole love other people thing? That's good. We can get behind that. In fact, it's interesting to note that, I don't know, most of the religions in the world have some form of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Treat people with kindness. And that was what Jesus did. He never lorded his power over everybody. He said, let me help you with that. Let me be with you. Let me walk with you. Because Jesus is different. You know, we know political leaders. We know kings and queens, right? We know how this works. Promises get made that never get fulfilled. 
Or you have some tyrannical king like we've seen throughout history. And yet Jesus is this king that shows up and says, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to do the legwork. And I'm not going to do it the easy way. Snap of the fingers, flick of the wrist, whatever. Jesus could have had anything done the way he wanted it to do. And yet how he did do things, how he won the battle that he is already proclaiming victory with, is humility, is with love. That's who Jesus is. Period. Jesus shares our likeness so that we might come to know what God is like. And what God is like is a God of love. God is love. It's not God is like love or that God has the attributes of love. God is love. Words are important. And so when the people who know that words are important see this Jesus coming into town, they instantaneously know and it clicks and they say, that is the king. That is the Messiah, the one from David's line, whom we have been waiting on, who will set the captives free. Only it didn't work the way they thought it was going to work. He didn't come in kicking the Romans out or nothing. He comes in and saves our souls. Long-term versus short-term goals. That's who Jesus is because that is who God is. That leaves us with a choice. We can go about our day as if this makes no difference. We can go about our day as we're waiting for next Monday to come where all the Easter candy's half off so we can get like a bunch of Cadbury eggs and stock up on them. Or we can do the other thing. And we can recognize this God of love who cares for us who wants us to be the best version that we can be and who guides us in humility and love. And when we do that, you're going to respond in some way, shape, or form. You can't know about Jesus and not be transformed in some way. I met a professional wrestler once, and I always thought I was going to play it cool and stuff. And I didn't. I panicked and freaked out. Could hardly have two words with the dude. Just a nice guy. Because when you see someone of power, of prominence, that's what you do. It's not what you should do. We should be doing what the people, what the disciples are doing in this story, which is recognizing who God is and shouting it so that the whole world knows. So you have two options today. You either go do that with your life, with your whole life, with everything that you are and everything that you say and believe and do. You can do that with your whole life, singing praises to God. Or you can wait around for the stones to do it. But the Savior has come. The Lord of lords, the King of kings, the God of love has drawn near to save us. I think it's a pretty good story that we should share with people. Amen.